Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Chris DeFay. I'm a member of the Authors at Google team here in Google Santa Monica office. For those of you joining us on YouTube uh, and RBC, uh, welcome. And uh, I'm very pleased today to introduce our guest, Matt Miller. Uh, many of us here in Santa Monica know Matt as the host and voice of the center of KCRW's talk show, Left, Right, and Center. Uh, Matt is also a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, a contributing editor at Fortune magazine, and he's also the author of the two 2003 book, The 2% Solution, Fixing America's Problems in Ways Liberals and Conservatives Can Love. In his latest book, The Tyranny of Dead Ideas, Letting Go of the Old Ways of Thinking to Unleash a New Prosperity, Matt continues his diagnosis of, America's, of American political and cultural life. Please join me in welcoming Matt Miller. Uh, thanks very much, Chris, and uh, thank you all for having me. And it's, um, it's really a special treat to be at Google, because uh, I'm just a huge, I'm a huge Google fan. Uh, like most Americans, Google plays a huge role in my personal life. In my last book, The 2% Solution, I thanked Google in the acknowledgments because it made doing the work that I do, which is a lot of research uh, that informs my writing, incredibly easy. And at the time, I said, um, you know, I wish, uh, not I wish, but I, I'd be willing to pay for it, you know? I would be willing to pay for it like a utility, which, you know, some people said that's, oh, you shouldn't say that, Google should be free, uh, but at least in my life I'd be willing to pay for it. Then I had the good fortune, I was mentioning to Chris, uh, a couple of years ago to meet a bunch of the senior executives, so Eric Schmidt and uh, Jonathan Rosenberg and Dave Drummond and is it Shauna Braun, uh, a few of the others, uh, when I spent uh, parts of a couple days up at the Googleplex and got to experience firsthand the wonderful cafeteria that I would read so much about and uh, the beach volleyball folks who were out there. So it was, um, it was, uh, it was tremendous fun. Then uh, when I was working on this book, The Tyranny of Dead Ideas, at one point I was so amazed by what I could do with Google Books, which hadn't been around uh, on my last book, uh, that I emailed Eric Schmidt about this because I had, for, for a chapter of the book, I had to find Horace Mann, you know, the old, uh, the Secretary of Education in Massachusetts, famous figure in American educational history. I had to find his uh, annual reports from the 1830s and 1840s that he had published, and when I Googled it, it turned out you could get the whole thing without leaving my laptop, you know, without leaving the house. So when you think about, and I, and I you know, I emailed Eric, just, I can't believe how this is, this so accelerates, it makes more efficient the kind of stuff that I have to do. It's kind of stunning, and I know this is just the beginning of what, uh, of what Google is making possible. And in my own life, that means that, you know, if you don't have to spend a day tracking something down at some obscure library, that means I can pick up my 11-year-old daughter from school. You know, I, there's, there's just myriad ways in which what you all are doing is changing everyone's lives, and I'm sure you know that, but uh, I just wanted to uh, say thank you. Uh, I, I also think, that it's, um, that it's uh, we're, we're in a similar business to the extent that I'm trying to explode dead ideas in our public life. I think Google as a business and as, a, as something with a social mission is in the business of exploding dead ideas every day. A few years ago, it was considered unthinkable that everybody on the planet should have access to all the world's information in some organized way. And now you all have come around, call along and exploded that, or are in the process of burying that dead idea in ways that are going to change the lives of literally everyone on the planet, you know, in the coming years. And uh, so I come before you as a kindred spirit, uh, as somebody who uh, 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 is in the, in the same mode of trying to explode ideas and look for new ways of thinking that I think are important uh, in our life. And so I hope that you'll find that, that the tyranny of dead ideas and the whole mission of moving beyond dead ideas is something that for, for Googlers will have special resonance. Now, I know, uh, that in, I know that in the rest of our culture, not everyone shares our enthusiasm for exploding dead ideas. Uh, I had a fun chance to do the Colbert Report the other night when the book, when the, when the book came out. And Col Colbert is very funny, uh, as you know. And he, he was very funny at my expense, which was actually a treat to get to experience, but what, one, of the, one of the funny things they go through is, uh, in addition to uh, him just saying things like, uh, one of the dead ideas in the book, as you'll see, is that taxes hurt the economy and they're always too high because taxes are going to go up in the next decade once we get past this recession, no matter who's in power, and I try and lay that out. And so when he, you know, he says, 
what's the next dead idea? And I said, taxes hurt the economy and they're always too high. And he goes, that's right, what's the dead idea? Uh, <laughs> then they had, um, the, other, the other really fun thing was in the green room before the show starts, uh, you know, he comes up and says, uh, he introduces himself, he seems like a very decent guy, and says, uh, you know, here's how it works. I play a character, that character is an idiot. Your, your, your job is to disabuse that character of his ignorance no matter what he's throwing at you and let's just have fun, which we did. But then uh, another, another person comes up who's one of the staffers and says, here's what the writers gave him. Uh, he may not use it, but you know, the writers take your book, they look at the title and they say, and they come up with a list of things, of questions he might ask just to spur his own thinking. As it turns out, he doesn't use any of it, but some of the things they had for the tyranny of dead ideas were um, potential questions like this. Uh, why should we, why should we, um, why should we switch to the, wh why should we get rid of the old ideas when the new ideas suck? Another idea, another question that he had potentially was, um, uh, even if the old ideas don't work anymore, shouldn't we still cling to them out of a sense of tradition? So, uh, you know, I, I, th I think the answer to that is no, and I hope uh, just in our time together today that I can persuade you of that when it comes to our public life. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell you we, we are meeting at an auspicious moment, um, which in my view is one of the scariest moments in memory if you think about what's happening in the markets and the economy, and one of the most hopeful if uh, you are as excited as I am about what happened yesterday and the Obama administration coming in with a really fresh breeze. I think um, the world is watching at this point uh, with great interest about what choices we are going to make in the period ahead and what this means for the future of American capitalism and thus capitalism across the world. It's interesting to me, and was a little surprising that we actually just sold the Chinese rights to the tyranny of dead ideas because it's mostly a book about you know, US, US policy uh, and politics and economics and business. And um, it just was you know, another small marker to me of the, uh, of the interest with which the world is thinking about the question, wither American capitalism. The title, I'm told, translated into Chinese is, do not let the demoted ideas control your world. Um, kind of a pithy thing that you can be sure will hit the bestseller racks in China. And I, I agree, we shouldn't let the uh, demoted ideas control our world. I think this is exactly in the spirit Obama was talking about yesterday when he said, we come to proclaim an end to outworn dogmas that for ta far too long have strangled our politics. He said, the stale political arguments that have consumed us for so long no longer apply. The world has changed and we must change with it. Um, I couldn't agree more. And so at this, um, at this critical hour, I'm trying to inject through this book um, a kind of modest mission to open the American mind because I think the battle to save the economy and our future really starts inside our heads. Now, the story I have to tell starts with some grim realities, but it ends with enormous hope so long as each of us commits to being open to new ways of thinking and to moving past old ways of thinking that don't make sense and, as importantly, to making the world safe for our leaders to do the same because that's often hard for them. It's a story that involves three facts, four forces, six dead ideas, and seven new ways of thinking that are destined to replace them. Now, a lot of you are engineers. I know you're thinking that adds up to 20 things. That's too much to remember. I know most of us can't remember uh, a 10 digit phone number about a second after we get it uh, from information, but I'm here to say this will go down easy. This is not hard to remember. In any way, it's all in the book. You don't need to take notes and you won't want to miss the richness of that material, I assure you. The gripping historical narrative, the accessible economics, the soaring prose, which I will not be able to do justice to in this talk, so you're just going to have to read the whole thing, uh, or at least buy some for your friends, is what my publisher says is all I can ask. So let's plunge in, and I'll talk for a bit, and then make sure there's ample time for Q&A so that we can engage on all this, because uh, I know you guys are a, a curious and engaged and thoughtful group. So here's how I frame the book. Three facts are poised now to shape our economic life for a generation. First, thanks to global competition and rapid technological change, large chunks of the U.S. economy are going to face their severest threat in nearly a century. Second, 
our political and business leaders are doing next to nothing to begin to help us cope with this. And third, that's because our entire political and economic culture is in the grip of a series of what I call dead ideas about the way a modern advanced economy like the United States should work. So the book is about the threat now posed to individuals, companies, and the country by the things we think we know and about the new and surprising ways of thinking that are destined to replace these dead ideas so that America continue, can continue to prosper. Now, the next decade is going to bring a collision of forces, I believe, that threaten to disrupt U.S. society, sink the middle class, and call into question the political and business arrangements on which our prosperity has rested for decades. These perils go far beyond the housing-related financial crisis that's plunged us into the current recession. In fact, I believe the need to steer our way through this near-term recession, which of course is extreme and serious and something we have to deal with, is actually masking in some ways longer-term economic challenges for the U.S. that are far more consequential. The stakes couldn't be higher. If America doesn't decisively manage these tides of change, and uh, I think we'll face a backlash against our economic system, which for all its flaws, has done more than any other system to bring more betterment to more people uh, than anything in human history. And if this backlash proves contagious, I believe, and other advanced nations lose faith in capitalism's ability to improve the life of ordinary people, the people, then the rich world's effort to protect citizens from economic change generally is going to doom the developing world to dollar a day poverty. That's a grim outlook. Now, I think the good news is that there are ways to avert this dark scenario and to flourish. The trouble is we're not doing what we need to because of what I'm calling the tyranny of dead ideas. By this, I mean the tacit assumptions and ingrained instincts that are broadly shared by business executives, professionals, policymakers, media observers, maybe even some of us in this room regarding the way a wealthy, advanced economy like the United States should work. Now, obviously, current thinking about the U.S. economy is not identical or monolithic across society. But the people who hold key positions across a lot of these sectors hold certain key premises. They believe our children will earn more than we do, first. Second, that free trade is good, no matter how many people it hurts. Next, that employers should play a central role in the provision of health coverage. Uh, next, that taxes hurt the economy, and they're always too high. We'll get into all these. Next, that local control of schools, local control and funding of schools is essential. And finally, that people tend, up, tend to end up in economic terms where they deserve to. These are ideas that have percolated throughout the culture for decades, becoming second nature to many of us. I think they determine which paths we consider, which uh, large questions we view as settled, which possibilities we allow ourselves to imagine. And I think that's where the problem lies, from the halls of government to the executive suite, from the corner store to the factory floor, Americans are in the grip of a set of ideas that are not only dubious or dead wrong, they're on a collision course with economic and social trends that are now irreversible. As these new realities crash against what people are stuck believing, there's a strange intellectual chasm that's being revealed. And it's not just ordinary people who are disoriented. The people who are actually calling the shots in our economy themselves are often lost at least to judge from the bizarre reasoning on display in lots of uh, exalted precincts. Let me give you a few examples. First, CEOs routinely gripe about how skyrocketing health care costs are posing a huge problem for their business. But then in the next breath, most of them immediately say, well, wait, we don't want government to play a bigger role in bearing part of this burden. Well, I ask, who else do they think is available? Next example, politicians and business leaders say we should cut taxes for most Americans, some would say all Americans, in order to boost the economy. Now maybe we need to do that near term. But America al already has 40 to 50 trillion dollars in unfunded promises in Social Security, Medicare, and other related retirement programs serving senior citizens. And that's before we toss in a whole bunch of other sensible ideas to ensure the uninsured, to extend preschool, to rebuild our infrastructure, to move toward clean energy, and more. Has anyone noticed that these numbers don't come remotely close to adding up? Next example. Everyone agrees education is the key to raising living standards in a future in which our kids are going to be competing with rising powers like India and China. Yet in the presidential campaign that we just went through, not a single candidate, not even Barack Obama, raised questions about the shockingly unjust system of school finance we have 
that dooms millions of poor kids to the worst teachers and the worst uh, facilities in the country. How are 10 million poor children in America supposed to compete? Final example, top economists in both political parties routinely tell us and reassure us that free trade is good for the country because the benefits to some Americans outweigh the losses to others who suffer from global competition. But I ask, who put economists in charge of weighing the interests of one set of Americans against another? Now, as puzzles like these ricochet across boardrooms, union offices, town halls, kitchen tables, I think the questions ask themselves. Why are business leaders afraid or unwilling to say that we need government to play a bigger role in the provision of health care? How can top officials call constantly for tax cuts when we have trillion in unpaid bills coming due? Why do politicians pledge to leave no child behind while they are system while they're overseeing public school systems that systematically assign the least qualified teachers and the worst facilities to the kids who need great schools the most? Why do free trade's losers get only lip service from even from elected representatives who say that workers are getting the shaft? I think the best explanation is not ultimately cynicism selfishness or indifference, nor is it really an inability to perceive and act on one's own long-term self-interest. No, the deeper ailment of afflicting today's confused capitalist is intellectual inertia. In every era, people grow comfortable with settled ideas about the way the world works. It takes an extraordinary shock to expose the conventional wisdom as obsolete and to open people's minds to what is now possible and what is necessary. Yet eventually a point get, gets reached where what once seemed unthinkable comes to seem inevitable. The climate of opinion gets transformed by events. It happened in the Great Depression when mass unemployment and hardship finally broke through long-standing taboos against government intervention in the economy. It happened during the Civil Rights Movement when televised horrors outraged the nation and brought a convulsion that ended legal discrimination based on race. It happened in the 1970s when recession, oil shocks and inflation mixed with this sense that welfare programs had spun out of control and brought a new consensus to renew the economy's animal spirits via lower tax rates, finally under Reagan. But the forces of the 21st century global economy, powerful as they are, and the effect of this current economic crisis, serious as it is, haven't yet proved strong enough to topple the unquestioned ideas that still continue to shape American economic life. Ideas about the nature of economic progress, the role of the federal government and the corporation, and the best way to balance the risk capitalism brings with the security people seek. In short, America's future is at risk still because of this tyranny of dead ideas. Now, the current recession and the meltdown of the financial system has obviously seen a quick consensus emerge about the role of government in a crisis. Obviously, the feds have been acting in unprecedented ways, and we're about to see a huge stimulus plan enacted, presumably with big bipartisan support. But it's not at all clear to me that the commotion that we're seeing now has altered the way we're going to see things on a durable basis once this crisis has passed, and it will pass. I think President Obama, therefore, has a rare opportunity to lead us in the rethinking we need, the kind of things that he referred to in his inaugural address. But in my view, this deeper change is also going to be forced on us by a shock that gets administered by four forces that accelerate in the next decade, even after we get past this current recession. The first of these forces is what I, is what I call white collar anxiety. And by that, I mean the way that uh, jobs higher up the income scale, doctors, lawyers, engineers even, uh, consultants, are going to face uh, competitive pressures from rising powers like India and China in ways that have been unimaginable uh, until very recently. You know, we've had a difficult enough time maintaining a consensus for technological change and open markets, while uh, many of the jobs that have been affected by this in years before were, uh, were lower-skilled jobs or blue-collar <coughs> jobs. How are our politics going to be changed when, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I need to turn my phone off. That's my ringtone. Apologies. Uh, but the question I ask is, is how are business and politics going to be changed when, um, when these potential wage threats and the potential downward mobility because of, uh, of these rising powers abroad is going to affect uh, groups that are more politically potent in ways that previously was unimaginable? The second force, I think, that's at work that's going to force these, uh, help force this rethinking is what I call the rush for, for the exits. 
And by that, I mean the way that corporate America basically wants to get out of the healthcare and pension business. Now, this is understood. This may not be happening at Google yet because you guys, uh, unlike many companies, aren't facing these stresses and are, and are in the midst of, thanks to your extraordinary achievement, a kind of extraordinary growth curve and enormous profitability. But as you know, uh, many companies are finding it very hard to sustain the healthcare and pension commitments that they have made in years past. And from business's point of view, it's totally understandable because these costs are becoming crushing and hurting uh, corporate competitiveness at a time when uh, other nations, the firms in other nations, are bearing far fewer of these costs. The problem is that many uh, American business leaders act as if their search for an exit strategy on benefits is the end of the discussion. But what happens to millions of Americans who are left uh, to the whirlwind if corporate America withdraws its safety net and we don't have plans in place to replace it with something else? The third force is what I call the gray boomer fiscal squeeze. And by that, I mean the way that the baby boomers' imminent retirement, which has started already and is going to accelerate in the next decade, is going to send government health and pension spending through the roof. At, a very time, at the very time when corporate America itself is withdrawing its safety net. Um, this is going to mean that at current levels of taxation, even big government is going to be strapped. It's not going to have the money available to do a lot of the things that we think government should be doing, like fund basic research, fund education, border security, uh, R&D. And uh, at current levels of taxation, the federal government will also have a hard time extending its own safety net at the very moment that corporate America is withdrawing its own. So what's going to happen there? Is government going to abandon or cut back those functions as the private sector is doing the same? If it doesn't and it steps in, how will it do so without raising taxes to levels that kill growth in ways that hurt the economy over the long term? The fourth force at work in the next decade that's uh, going to force a rethinking of a lot of the, uh, the ways we've done things is what I call the rise of extreme inequality. And you've all seen the, you see in the papers, uh, while, the, while the rise of these other forces is placing a lot of strains on most Americans, there's a class of folks at the very top who have been pulling away at levels never before seen. And often, this is happening in ways that clearly aren't the result of uh, people being rewarded by the free market, but it's happen happening because of rigged systems that as often are rewarding mediocrity or even failure as opposed to success. My favorite examples of this are the subprime banking crisis we've seen. We've got uh, probably several thousand people who had a lot to do with what happened on Wall Street and the shakeout that we're not now seeing throughout the country who were retired to the country club, who made tens of millions of dollars peddling what ended up being very bogus securities. But because they booked profits and were able to get bonuses off that before everything hit the fan, uh, they're sort of immune from anyone looking back at what they've made while the rest of the country is left holding the bag. We see banking CEOs every day, whether it's Ken Lewis at Bank of America in the last couple of weeks, or uh, the fellow at Washington Mutual in Seattle, who again presided over uh, enormous kind of phony growth and profits, walked away with $100 million or more while their banks, and as a result, good chunks of the country are left devastated. I think that the combination of these, um, and I, I am, you should know, I am an ardent capitalist. The reason I wrote this book is to try and update what we're doing with American capitalism so it avoids a backlash against the kind of innovation, dynamism, and wealth creation that I think is essential, not just for our own future, but to bring the benefits of, our, uh, of capitalism around the world to raise developing countries out of poverty. But I think that the way that we're seeing uh, an increasing number of what you might think of as the undeserving ultra-rich is going to spawn a backlash against capitalism that wrongly discredits the system altogether if we don't get out front of it and find ways to, um, to, to rein in these excesses. So I think the collision of these sets of forces are going to um, expose fundamental flaws in a lot of our previous ways of thinking. I think it's going to hurtle us toward a moment when fundamental questions are up for grabs in ways that they haven't been since the architects of the post-war economic structure sat down to chart a course beyond depression of war over half a century ago. This raises lots of big questions. Can middle class societies be sustained uh, in wealthy nations in an era of globalization? Can democracy survive the emergence of what I'm calling extreme inequality? How will these trends affect the hopes of the developing world? Uh, because they need access to our markets if they're going to rise. And finally, can Americans build secure and happy lives amidst all this tumult? 
I think the answers to those questions are going to depend on how quickly we're able to move beyond the pernicious influence of six dead ideas. Let me lay them out for you briefly. Now, there are probably dozens of dead ideas in our public life. There's uh, tons in our business and personal life. I actually have a chapter I have at the back of the book about how to sort of move beyond dead ideas in your business life or personal life. I, I know I couldn't get through the day without a good dead idea or two in my own professional life. I cling to the idea that rational analysis can lead to constructive change which, if you've studied any history, may not have been that uh, live an idea in the first place. So uh, we are all prey to these things. I think the question is how, 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 how quickly can we summon the perspective to realize which ones are in our midst and which ones are threatening. So the six dead ideas that I talk about in the book, and I can lay them out now, we can talk about more about them in conversation, are as follows. The first, which sounds grim, but I think is a set of facts we have to deal with honestly so that we can uh, improve life in spite of it. The first dead idea is what I call the kids will learn more than we do. And by that, I refer to the classic American dream of upward mobility. It's basically been knit into the fabric of American society that the next generation will always do better than this generation. It's what uh, our founders believed. It's what, uh, it's what the uh, kind of icons of our country, Benjamin Franklin, Abraham Lincoln were you know, emblems, poster boys of upward mobility. Uh, in our literature, Horatio Alger novels in the 19th century, to Jay Gatsby, you know, in the 20th century, the idea of the self-made uh, American who can pull themselves up by the bootstraps through grit and determination is essentially this iconic uh, belief in our life. I think that is at odds now with the latest research that shows that up to 100 million Americans live in families that are earning less than their parents did at a similar age. And this, is, this trend is coming before so those facts are before we've begun to feel the full effect of economic integration with the rest of the world and the competition with rising powers like China and India. So I think that that number will worsen. I think that uh, as a result of our faith in this ever-rising tide, obviously that's done enormous things for our national character. We're a can-do nation. We help win two world wars. We put a man on the moon. People like you all create Google. There's a can-do spirit that that, has, um, that, that, that uh, idea helps embody. But our faith in this ever-rising tide, I think, has posed a few problems for us now as a country. One is, I believe that we overestimate the power of the individual to shape his own economic destiny. You know, in America, there's been so much opportunity on offer that the general sentiment in the culture has been, if you can't make it in America, it must be your fault. And I think that as we see more and more even hardworking Americans finding it harder because of the forces I described to get themselves on an upward path, we're going to have to rebalance our traditional faith in the power of the individual with, um, and supplement that with, uh, by asking ourselves, what's the role of the community in assuring opportunity and security in a wealthy nation like the United States? I also think that the, uh, the, as a result of this faith that we'll always sort of have more money down the road because that's the American way, that's also led to this ethic of, uh, of debt and kind of debt-fueled consumption that has finally burst. And it's left us in a situation where we've got uh, all this debt that we're working through, all these unfunded promises at the public sector and government level, uh, and we're going to have to face some of those realities in ways that will uh, let us move beyond them. And I think that uh, I talk about the kids earning more than we do as a dead idea, not because, uh, because Americans can't be better off in the future, but because unless we change the way we think, and unless we uh, enact new ways to help assure opportunity and security in this new era, uh, we won't be able to help folks live better lives even amidst these stresses. So that's the first dead idea. The second dead idea I call free trade is good no matter how many people get hurt. And there, we can talk again more about it in Q&A, I'm talking about the way economists of both parties have basically, I think for political reasons in part, hyped the benefits of free trade and tried to minimize the impact on the losers and the downside. And while the answer to that I don't think is protectionism, I think if we close up our borders that makes it worse for us and for the rest of the world in the long term, it is a set of new protections so that people have some sense of security even amidst change uh, that'll let us retain a consensus to have the dynamic economy we want and that you all uh, exemplify but at the same time doesn't leave tens of millions of people uh, literally devastated uh, because of economic changes that are going on. The third dead idea I call your company should take care of you. 
And by that, I refer to the employer-based system of health care and benefits that is kind of unique in the United States. No other advanced nation, to this extent, runs their welfare state basically through corporations. And in each of the chapters of the book, I do a kind of mini biography of the dead idea. Where did it come from? Why did it make sense for a long time? What changed in circumstances that now makes it harmful or even dangerous? And why is it persisting, even though it's, its time has passed? And uh, in, in the, whole, uh, the whole issue of company-based benefits, um, there's an interesting history to this, which is not the way, uh, it's, not the, it's not quite the story we're usually told. The story we're usually told is that, you know, during World War II, there was a, um, there was a uh, wage and price freeze, and benefits were exempt for that, from that, so that uh, companies started offering benefits as a way to compete for talent. Something not unfamiliar, maybe in the Google world. And uh, the government came in and ratified that arrangement with a big tax subsidy after the war, and health benefits and pensions to some extent really grew enormously to what we have today. But that makes it sound, while that's all true, that, that's misleading because it makes it sound like our, our vast corporate welfare state was actually uh, an accidental byproduct of wartime pricing policy, when I think the more interesting story really goes back to the beginning of the 20th century, when in the first kind of rebellion against the excesses of industrial capitalism, you know, sweatshops, the conditions in factories, uh, unions started to get traction. Europe was heading uh, toward different ways of trying socialism. And the business community in the US and its conservative political allies said, wait, we got to find a way to keep a lid on this. And what the, the strategy they arrived at, not, not through six guys sitting around a table, but basically the strategy that was, was arrived at was to offer benefits. The bigger companies that could do it would offer benefits to employees to give them more security uh, and try and uh, stop the slippery slope toward greater unionization and greater state involvement in, in business life. And this worked for a long time, both before the war and then after World War II when we were the only economy left standing because corporate America was basically able to pass on through higher pricing the cost of much of America's welfare state. And for a long time that worked when there was one single breadwinner who worked 35 years at a single company and the family was dependent on him. But as we all know, that's changed dramatically. People have 10 jobs by the time they're 40. Uh, both spouses are working. And increasingly, as costs rise, companies can't bear these, the, the cost of these benefits. So um, the, the way I try and argue to business leaders who are the most important holders of this debt idea, because they're still resisting the idea that government as opposed to business should play a bigger role and that we can do that and not become socialist. We'll, we're not gonna, we don't have to be, have a Canadian system or a United Kingdom single payer system. There are market friendly ways to move health care and, and more pension support uh, to the government budget. Um, and we can talk about that. But the, um, what, what I try and convince business leaders is that if you look at it the right way, uh, the employer based health care system was a powerful tool in our long twilight struggle against communism. But we won that fight. Even with the interventions that we're seeing now that are extraordinary because of the current financial crisis, the risk of America becoming socialist is near zero. The risk of us becoming protectionist because of enormous worker anxiety and a backlash against our system that leaves people so insecure amidst all this change is serious. And the only way we'll get beyond that is if corporate America uh, kind of looks at the facts afresh lets the tumblers click and realizes that uh, it's OK and safe for them to let go of some of this so long as they're also a constituent and a voice for what government needs to do to pick up more of that burden. So that's the, uh, the fourth dead idea. The fifth is that taxes hurt the economy, and they're always too high. And I say that not because I want taxes to go up uh, and not because we won't be cutting taxes in the next two years, because we will. But uh, as I mentioned, in the next decade, there's no question that no matter who is in political power, taxes will rise because we're going to double the number of people on Social Security and Medicare. And John McCain's advisors, I quote in the book, saying, of course, no matter who's in power over the next decade, ta taxes are going to go up. And so the good news is we're not going to become France and Sweden. They don't need to rise that high. Uh, and the economy will be fine. It's a kind of myth that the level of taxes we'll have to go to to accommodate the baby boom, baby boom is going to hurt the economy. But uh, as you know, these are undiscussable facts in our political life today. Neither party, for various reasons, will talk about them. The Republicans are, hate the idea of giving up the tax issue because they've ridden it so, so powerfully since Ronald Reagan in 1980, even though their own far-sighted thinkers know that taxes are going to have to rise somehow in aggregate. And the Democrats, uh, obviously, who've been bitten over the, beaten over the head by the tax cut club from Republicans always have to be for some kind of tax cuts, too, or else they're not competitive in elections. This will all change in the next decade, not in the next two years as we fight the recession, 
but in the next decade, and the opportunity we have by getting beyond this dead idea, and the opportunity each of you have by uh, being open to this thinking and making the world safe for politicians to lead in a different way, is that we can do, we can improve our prosperity by changing the way I, we tax ourselves and by taxing ourselves in smarter ways as we meet what's going to inevitably be this need for more revenue. I think that means we should be taxing dirty energy more, you know, through carbon taxes and the like, and cutting taxes on payrolls and things because that affects low-income people the most and also kills jobs. So the, the, as we explode this dead idea, uh, there's an opportunity to rethink in ways that will help all of us live, uh, live in a stronger economy. Uh, the fifth dead idea is schools are a local matter. And by that I refer to the, uh, the way that we rely, again, uniquely in the advanced world on 15,000 local school districts and local property taxes supplemented by some state taxes to fund our schools and basically to set standards for our schools. Districts and the states basically set this uh, with the federal government playing only a modest role. And I think, in the, I think this made perfect sense in the 19th century, the way we do local funding today. But today, for reasons I said, I think it dooms kids in poor neighborhoods uh, to educations that will leave them fundamentally unable to thrive in the economy that we have in the 21st century. And we'll need a greater federal role in standard setting and in funding if we're going to lift the bottom in ways that are in all our interests uh, in the period ahead. Then the last debt idea is what I call money follows merit, um, which is the idea that basically uh, in America there's a sense that, we, uh, that market capitalism is an economic meritocracy, that we end up economically where we deserve to. And I think uh, for some of the reasons I mentioned, the forces that are now at work uh, are going to make it hard, even for the hardest working Americans at different levels or in different job sectors, to be able to thrive the way they were in the past. And I think as we explode that idea that you end up where you are because you deserve to, that it'll help us rebalance what we think the role of the community is versus the role of the individual and making sure that there is some kind of decent life uh, and decent educational opportunity for folks who otherwise may be struggling. So um, why, don't I, um, why don't I try and wrap it up there? I think the, you know, the persistence, just a couple of closing thoughts and then hopefully we can engage in conversation. You know, the persistence of these dead ideas involves a failure to adapt to change circumstances, right? This is not a, a new thing in human history. It's something that uh, applies to all our lives. It applies in businesses. The, the questions at the heart, of, uh, uh, the heart of the book, which are really, are, is America, or, or a set of old ways of thinking stopping America from coping with globalization and and the challenges of rapid technological change in ways that would be good for us. Those are very similar to questions like, why didn't newspapers realize that the internet posed a fundamental threat to their business model more quickly? And even to questions like, why doesn't uh, John realize that Emily's new job means that he needs to be more helpful with the kids? Uh, you know, the, you can't develop a strategy for a country or a company, and certainly not yourself, Unless, uh, unless, unless you're willing to face up to the, the actual facts and then develop ways of thinking that are appropriate to the times. You know, this is not rocket science. Um, and yet, the, the way that we continually get trapped in dead ideas, I think, is also kind of a function of human nature. You know, the perils of orthodoxy at times of rapid change have been with us since, you know, since time immemorial. Uh, you know, the, the obituaries of civilizations that have failed, of businesses that have failed, of marriages that don't make it, are littered with old ways of thinking that people couldn't, uh, couldn't update when the times demanded it. And I, think, uh, and I think in that sense, while it's urgent that we rethink this stuff, we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. The, the real measure of a, a person and a business or a society isn't necessarily the dead ideas we fall prey to because we all fall prey to them. It's how quickly we're able to summon the imagination and perspective to recognize these dead ideas that are in our midst and then explode them and move past them before real damage or more damage gets done. Thank you. So anyway, I would love to talk with you guys about any any questions you have, dead ideas, the destined ideas that will replace them we can talk about? Well, we're all engineers and into process here. Have you heard of any formal um, processes that organizations or individuals can go through uh, in order to re-examine ideas that they may uh, assume are base facts? 
Um, I actually think, and I, I actually have an afterword to the book that's a chapter on moving beyond dead ideas in business and beyond or something like that. And I think one of the biggest things, you know, the, you, I've worked in big organizations in my, I spent part of my life as a, an advisor with McKinsey consulting to big companies. And so I'm around big organizations. And, um, you know, there are lots of, uh, and Google, look, Google has a very unique culture, so this may not apply to Google, but, um, you know, in most of, most big organizations, companies or nonprofits, there can be real career risks to taking on the conventional wisdom and the sacred cows. And I think one of the most important things that has to be, where, that space has to be made for is for, um, is, is to legitimize dissent and to institutionalize a kind of routine re-examination of the fundamental premises of the organization. And I think we need to do it as a society, and I think we need to do it, you know, any organization needs to do it. And, you know, it's useful in your personal life from time to time as well, because, um, and, so, and so I try and talk about ways that I think you could almost do a kind of dead ideas assessment or review, that it, it has to be championed from the top of an organization, because if there's not license given, to, uh, to people who are essentially going to be the heretics who, can t who, have, who have the freedom to say, no, we're going to question the fundamental things that we think are the premises of how we're operating, then you can't get the stuff on the table. And internal politics or psychology or groupthink makes it really hard. I think the way people are paid can disincent that also. I think that's one of the ways in the banking business. You had so many people making so much money uh, peddling what was clearly had clearly become a dead idea with the subprime mortgage stuff, and you know when people are getting fabulously wealthy, doing something that's really perverse for the economy as a whole, there was no way to stop it. And uh, so uh, I think there are ways you, you have to make sure you don't pay people to ignore dead ideas. Um, anyway, those those are some thoughts, and I go into a little more in the book. Everyone else is speechless. I've, I've got a question for you. Sure. So um, one, uh, I guess, dead idea might seem to be uh, a statement which is an oxymoron, dynamic and efficient government, right? Now, if your proposal is, is you know, government needs to be more involved, what are ways or strategies that perhaps we or the government can use to basically not have that be an oxymoron? Um, it's a great question. and. Most of the things, when I think government has to play a bigger role on some of this stuff, I actually don't want government running lots of things. I want government funding things, which it's very good at. Government's very good at essentially providing vouchers to people for services or cutting social security tax or paying Medicare. I mean, as a, as a mechanism for payments and checks, government's actually quite good. Um, and I think that there are ways that we can essentially voucherize some of the services I'm talking about. So in healthcare, I'm not talking about a Canadian-style single payout system where the government runs everything. I'm talking about government subsidizing people who need help at the low end to buy, essentially, a, a decent family health plan at group rates from among competing private carriers. The doctors are private. They don't work for the government. The, you know, the insurers may have more regulations, so they can't cherry pick people according to health. But by funding the right things and by setting up the framework for the markets to operate in ways that don't end up being perverse, because what you have, as you know, in the health insurance business, and if anyone's ever tried to get coverage in the individual market as opposed to from a company, if you have any ripple in your health history at all, they won't insure you. That's, you know, that's not their fault necessarily. That's just not in their economic interest. And so you have to find ways that people are in pools that they can get group rates. Government can make sure that the rules of the game uh, are set up in ways they can do that. So um, uh, we may need, you know, I'm sure there's a case for more radical rethinking, and Obama's going to try and do some of this to improve government performance of things it does run, like garbage collection to railroads to airline systems, et cetera. Um, but in t most of the things I'm talking about would involve different ways of funding and light touch regulations that, that create a framework for the markets to be harnessed properly. Um, how optimistic are you that, that the Obama administra <coughs> administration is going to start uh, correcting some of these problems, especially given um, all the experience that some of his cabinet appointees have with these dead ideas? Um, I'm, ver I'm, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I'm very optimistic for a couple reasons. One, just because his own sensibility is he's someone who wants to look pragmatically at what will work in this era. And even since, even in the Democratic primary, he was talking about finding the ideas that whether they're 
Republican or Democratic or Independent or wherever they come from, we need to find things that will work at this time, not things that um, you know, fit some ideological box. And I think that's really hopeful. I think the, the fact that um, some of his, some of his uh, team uh, is experienced, I mean, look, I, I worked in the Clinton administration with a bunch of these folks. I was in the White House budget office. And they're very talented folks. And the, um, you know, everyone needs to find ways to update their sense of what was politically possible. A lot of times, folks who know that we're in the grip of these dead ideas, there's not a political opening to really revisit some of them. And the great virtue, if you can say there's a, you know, a silver lining to the crisis we're in, is that it just totally expands the boundaries of political possibility. And so I hope he aims really big on taking a lot of this stuff on, because I think we're in one of those moments where people are open to rethinking with the right leadership. So I am, uh, I am hugely hopeful. Now, my wife thinks that's a high serotonin issue, my optimism, so. <laughs> Yes. When you said that the government does a good job at cutting checks and paying people, um, does that include like inefficient use of money? Say again? The inefficient, inefficient use of money, for example, paying large amounts of money to government contractors that ends up being wasted? No, I think that's bad. Uh, like, what's a, what's a way to fix it? Um, you know, the, the, like contracting reform, you mean, in the Defense Department, or things where we're paying $800 for, uh, you know, a, a, a toilet seat on, a, on an Air Force plane? Uh, smarter people than I would have to, there, there, there are agendas for trying to improve the contracting and the way we buy a lot of things in the government. And you're right, there's a lot of stuff, there's no question there's a lot of waste. But on the things I'm talking about, which is essentially if you want to give somebody uh, some kind of supplement, a certificate or a voucher that would let them go, help them buy a health care plan, or would let them help pay for uh, some school or tutoring they need, uh, I think there, uh, there's a pretty decent case that government can do that well. Um, there's no question there's lots of waste in government that has to get addressed. The truth is, though, I think that that waste and pork, which John McCain made such a big issue of, obviously there's lots of pork. Uh, and pork barrel projects. Now remember, one, one person's pork is another congressman's, you know, essential local jobs program. So in some ways, pork is in the eye of the beholder. But all that stuff, if you add up all the stuff that McCain always talked about as pork, it's less than 1% of federal spending. And so even if we sliced it all out, it wouldn't make a, a material difference to the bigger trends I'm talking about in terms of uh, where the money's really going. Yeah, uh, it seems like another dead idea is that someone who's born in America who has a certain education and expertise level has a birthright to make more money and enjoy a higher standard of living than someone with a similar or maybe even higher uh, expertise in other countries. Yet that would be an excruciating idea uh, throughout America. To contemplate. America. Yeah, so I'm wondering sort of what, what you think about that and, and how you think uh, we can gradually uh, come to grips with that. I think I think we're at this uh, we're in this period in our economic history where we want to balance a couple of things. One is we want American people to continue to thrive and grow and enjoy the progress and uh, and reach their human potential and the reward and material satisfaction that may be a part of what that what that brings. But we're, we have this enormous ability for the rest of the world to rise which from the point of view, if you're taking a global, you know, if you're God looking down on the planet, that's a wonderful thing for humanity. But for a lot of, uh, a lot of workers in advanced nations, it's a threat. And so the question, to me at least, or the challenge is, how do we, how do we balance making sure we have a good life in America with not stopping people around the world from rising and realizing their potential. And I think we're in this adjustment period over the next few decades where that's going to be one of the biggest challenges we face. Now, Britain went through something like this. You know, since the 1880s or 1890s, Britain was said to be in decline as America and other powers rose. And, you know, if you look at the standard of living in Britain today, it's orders of magnitude great, you know, better than it was in 1890, even though it was in a period of what, you know, some people would say was relative 
decline. And so, you know, the march of technology, basically the kind of enterprise that you're involved in, the continuing ability for technology to improve, you know, push outward the possibilities for growth and, and uh, wealth creation and innovation, assure us, I think, that we can keep making the pie bigger. But I'm sure that in Britain, just as we're going to have the case here, those first couple decades, there were families that were affected that had a hard time. And I think the challenge for us as a country is to make sure that we have a that we have protections in place for those people whose expectations may be disappointed or who are affected negatively by the rise of other places um, in a way that still lets us preserve the global dynamism that lets everybody move forward over time, even though some people are going to struggle more here. And it's particularly hard for, you know, because politicians don't run on a, their, their constituency isn't global. If you're a labor union leader, your folks are affected here. If you're a presidential candidate, your folks are affected here. And the fact that it's a great thing for humanity is no consolation to you know, workers in Detroit who see that their you know, lives that they built are now at risk. And so for reasons that are obvious, this is hard. But I think it's essential for us to confront this in ways that keep those objectives I'm describing in mind so that uh, in, over time, everybody ends up better off. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah, it's it's always kind of interesting when when speakers come to Google. I've noticed um, because obviously it's a, it's a critical issue for our country, and yet we at Google every day, every hour, we're working with those people in other countries, and we're very much a global uh, company, and, right. and we very much want to build products for the whole world. So it's, there is that sort of tension of you know uh, you know trying to make things better for everyone on the one hand, and yet at the same time balancing things for America. And they, I'm sure, because there must be engineers overseas who get paid a different thing than engineers here. And that, that's a, I don't know, is that an issue for you guys? It's a, it's a risk? It's a... Well, I don't know if I could speak to that in particular, but, but certainly, I mean, these are the folks that we work with every day. So it's, you know, we're not looking for ways of how do we compete against our sure. friends in India or England right. or wherever else. So. Right. You seem to subscribe to the, what I consider, dead idea that socialism is a dirty word. Why is it? That socialism is a dirty word? Yeah. Um, and you think that's a dead idea because it's, it's, just, it's coming back. It's time is now. Well, with the failure of capitalism, and not just recently, but it seems it's built on the idea that there will always be a poor class and a wealthy class and always has this inequality. Um, I guess uh, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not, a, it's funny because people on the right, political right, view me as a socialist. When I talk about what I'm talking about in the book, they basically say, you're a socialist. I've been, you know, in these shout fests with people on talk radio as I've been rolling the book out because when you talk to that audience, they say you're a socialist. And when I talk to the uh, people who are on the political left in the U.S., they say, why are you so conservative? Why do you think business has a you know, a role to play in helping assure liberal goals, et cetera. So, um, uh, so I guess I'm a little eclectic that way. I mean, I, I guess I think socialism is not the way to uh, maximize the human potential in a society. I guess I think capitalism, properly regulated, is the best thing we've stumbled on to achieve the kind of economic growth, but also marry it with social justice. And I think the US form of this has erred on the side of letting um, letting inequities grow too great and letting the bottom fall too low. And I think that uh, there are ways we can find a, um, you know, an updated version of American capitalism that will achieve the goals that I'm talking about. But I, I guess I don't think, I don't like uh, government, I don't want government to own all the banks and all these businesses. I think government's going to have to do all this stuff for the next few years because the private sector made a huge mess of things. But that's not what I would like to see as the, the lasting state of affairs if we're going um, if, if to try and achieve the things that I, I hope we're going to try and achieve. So I don't think it's a dirty word. It's true. I have developed a kind of verbal tick from talking to conservative audience. Because um, if you look at the book, I'm really trying to reach business leaders with a lot of this to get them to change the way they think about what their role should be in government's role. And so whenever I say that taxes are going to go up, but we're going to be fine, we won't become France or Sweden, uh, if I don't say that, I've learned with conservative audiences, the first thing they pounce on you with is, you want us to be France or Sweden? And the answer is, no, I don't. France or Sweden in those countries are, you know, 50% of taxes and 
taxes and spending are 50 percent of GDP. We're around 30 today. There's room for us to go up as the boomers retire, as we insure the uninsured and do a bunch of other stuff and still be more of a rough, tough cowboy economy than you know, a cradle to grave nanny state that, uh, that a certain part of our uh, uh, political spectrum and an audience I want to reach fears and sort of just revolts against. The, so when I speak to more progressive groups and I say, don't worry, we won't become France or Sweden, they'll say, what's wrong with France or Sweden? And uh, I think there's a lot of good things about France and Sweden, and I can confide that here. But I think there's a middle way that we need to get to, and maybe you can appreciate why I, I, I clearly have that rhetoric kind of baked into my head, because so many of the folks I'm trying to persuade turn off if you don't paint a picture for them, which realistically isn't France or Sweden, which is what I'm talking about. So, Thank you. long answer. No, <laughs> but don't worry, I'm called a socialist on, you know, on the web all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm the center on left, right, and center on KCRW, and I always tell people that the center in LA is practically a Marxist in the rest of the country anyway, so. So I have a question about the, the money follows merit. I want to know what you think about uh, campaign finance, the way that uh, finance or politics is financed in the U.S., and how it uh, fits in with that. I would like us to have, um, I, I don't think, I, I think it's impossible to ever take private money out of, um, out of politics, just as a matter of realistic pragmatism. So what, I've, what I would always, I've always wanted to have a system where you can also, um, uh, the most interesting idea I've seen, which I actually wrote about in my first book, The 2% Solution, was something called Patriot Dollars, which was an idea from a Yale Law professor named Bruce Ackerman. And what he says is, let's give every voter a $50 voucher, essentially, every election cycle, that they can call them Patriot Dollars, that they can donate to candidates, the Sierra Club, the NRA, you name it. And if you do that, you inject, you know, this is when he did it a couple years ago, $50 times 100 million voters would be injecting $5 billion in this public money, but not through some central bureaucracy deciding who gets it. It would be a, a grassroots way of people being empowered to vote with their dollars what kind of causes or candidates they want to support. And you put in enough money there that it more than, you know, at the time I think private money was three and a half or four billion. So you're just augmenting it through a kind of grassroots public financing that would make it possible if people choose to be funded publicly in this way. And, um, you know, that's, that's considered radical. But uh, th that's the solution that I'm, I find most appealing. And I find a lot of the stuff that we do, I thought McCain Feingold, you know, again, it's called a big victory, and I don't think it changed things much at all, and that's, that's what happens with a lot of, uh, there's a lot of charades, you know, in terms of what we call solutions that get passed. And what do you think about the, uh, the example of how, like, Barack Obama raised his, his uh, campaign money through using, basically, having people donate small amounts multiple I love, times like I, that? I love that, and I, I would even like to, I think something like this, where you actually put in some public money to the grassroots as, as more that people could essentially contribute on the internet, because that's how you'd set it up, would be a way to even out the playing field a little bit. Um, and stop politicians from spending all their time groveling to wealthy donors, because that's what so often happens. Thank you. OK, any last question? OK, uh, thank you, Matt, for, uh, for coming today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.